Welcome to this online book talk. We're bringing you the talk from the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies and the Asia Dynamics Initiative at the University of Copenhagen. Our speaker, Joel Andreas, is currently in the United States where he's a professor of sociology at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And we're going to be talking about a book that he published last year called Disenfranchised, The Rise and Fall of Industrial Citizenship in China. We've been hoping to have this talk in the flesh a few weeks ago and that we'd be able to entertain Joel and take him out to enjoy some fine Nordic cuisine, but unfortunately circumstances are such that we have to do this uh, in a virtual rather than a, a physical way. Joel has published a couple of books before. He got some prizes for his book, Rise of the Red Engineers on the Cultural Revolution, the Origins of China's New Class. And he also recently published another edited volume, which is called Factory Politics of China. He's a sociologist who's been working a lot on industrial policy and the transformation of China uh, over the past few decades. And I know that for this book, he's done a lot of field work on the ground. He's interviewed people working in and running factories and brings a lot of first-hand insight to the project that's brought together in this book. And he will be moderated and questioned by our good friend and colleague Chunlong Liu, who is the Executive Vice Director of the Fudan European Center for China Studies, which is here at uh, the University of Copenhagen, hosted by the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies. Chunron is an associate professor in the School of International Relations and Public Affairs at Fudan University, but he's for many years been seconded to Copenhagen to work with us on China-related matters here. He did his PhD at City University of Hong Kong. So I'm going to hand over at this point to Chunron, who will take things forward from here. Um. I'd like to join uh, Duncan to, to thank Professor Joe Andres for offering this special book talk. I'm also grateful to uh, Marie of ADI for organizing this webinar and having me as a facilitator. Um, so welcome all of you and, and thanks for tuning in and so in online solidarity with us. And um, as Duncan mentioned, the topic of uh, Joe's uh, latest book, um, uh, as, uh, address a very critical issue in, in China, and it has, has a very important uh, historical and uh, global contest, even in Scandinavia, where labor are powerfully organized and protected by the welfare states, we can still feel some uh, challenges of, uh, of uh, labor conditions associated with uh, neoliberalization. So I'm sure this book talk and, uh, uh, and this webinar will not only enrich our understanding about the uh, production regime in China, but also um, invites uh, broader uh, reflections from uh, comparative perspectives. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to um, hand over to, to the floor to Joe, and I understand that Joe so will we'll talk about for 45 minutes, um, and then we have a Q&A session, right? We might have a break. Uh, and during your talk, right? Uh, so the floor is yours. Um, I'd like to thank Chun Rong Liao and Marie Yoshida and Duncan McCargo for organizing this talk and for hosting this talk, inviting me to participate. I wish I could have come to uh, Copenhagen and uh, seen all of you in person, but um, this is better than than nothing. This is this is a great opportunity. This is a, a great chance to explore a new. Uh, venue. Um, I also would like to thank everybody who showed up to listen to the talk and I would look forward to your comments and questions. I'll be um, taking a break about two-thirds of the way through the talk uh, to let you answer some questions on the first part of the talk. Um, and so you can send in questions all the time, I believe, uh, to Twinrong and he will be uh, asking me your questions. Um, so, this is a talk about my new book, uh, Disenfranchised, The Rise and Fall of Industrial Citizenship in China. Uh, it's based on more than 10 years of research at, uh, in factories in China, 
uh, looking at the evolving relationship, evolving relationship between workers and managers in China's factories. Um, it is, I'm now having trouble moving my, Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, I've given this talk a number of times, including, and I've discussed these issues with students in my classes. And um, it's, I've, I've to, when I, I talk about in a global era of industrial citizenship, um, which extended from the Second World War through the 1980s. It was based on, I talk about the work unit system in China, which was based on long-term job tenure, really permanent job tenure for workers during this era. And when I was talking about it in class uh, recently, actually it was when I was in Hong Kong with a French exchange student though, she said, well, that wasn't only true in China, that was true in France as well. Uh, during, the same, during this period, workers had uh, long-term, they stayed in the factories most of their lives. And that's absolutely true. That's why it's a global era of industrial citizenship. Uh, workers in many countries during this period enjoyed long-term job tenure. And not only that, they weren't considered simply hired hands. They were considered legitimate stakeholders in the factories. Moreover, they were highly organized through unions and through work councils, different types of organizations in different countries. Some of these were more autonomous than others. Um, and they were actually organized by the workers. Others were organized by management, factory management, or by the state. But they all provided in one way or another a venue for participation by employees of the factory to participate in the management of the factory and decision making, one way or another. Um, and because of these conditions, workers actually enjoyed extensive influence in factories during this period in many countries around the world. Uh, this was also a period when the slogan of industrial democracy was in, <clears throat> was in vogue. Uh, now, this was never fully realized in any country. The factories were actually run democratically, but workers often had substantial power inside factories during uh, the ideas of industrial citizenship and industrial democracy originated in Europe in the early 20th century, uh, but they were later extended to the developing world, and they extended also to both capitalist and socialist countries. Um, many, many different countries, these ideas were very important during this period. Um, since the 1980s, however, uh, these ideas and the actual institutions that were built uh, during this period uh, have been severely eroded with the rise of, of neoliberalism and its extension around the world. Um, this book, my book, is exclusively about China. It's looking at the evolution of industrial, uh, industrial relations in China during, uh, from 1949, the Chinese Communist Revolution until the present. Uh, this is particularly interesting to study these questions in China because the changes have been so great. Uh, and in the book, I compare two eras. Uh, the first era uh, might be called the work unit system era from the 1940s to the 1980s, uh, roughly this period of industrial citizenship. The second era is the modern, could be called what they call it in China today, the modern enterprise system from the 1990s to the present. Um, the transition from the work unit era to the modern enterprise system uh, has been called in China industrial restructuring. Uh, and there's been quite a bit of research on this process of industrial restructuring. Um, most of this research has been on the economic impact of industrial restructuring. My research has been on the political impact. And what I mean by that is the changing relations of power between workers and managers inside factories. Um, in this book, I join a, a longstanding debate about the relationship between job tenure, employee dependency, and workplace power. Um, the, this debate has been really framed for many years by the classic book by Andrew Walter, Communist Neo-Traditionalism, um, published in 1986. It was about the work unit era. It was about the work unit system. Um, and he made this the following argument. 
that permanent employment in Chinese factories, as well as the workplace provision of welfare, housing and pensions and medical care, education for workers' kids, uh, all of this led to dependency, dependency of the workers on the workplace, and not only on the workplace, but on their immediate superiors. And in order to break this dependence, he argued, you had to end the system of permanent job tenure. Now, his view has been contested by other scholars who say that it's one-sided. Uh, they have argued that secure job tenure actually, in, in many ways, enhanced workers' power. Among these scholars are Qingfang Li and Elizabeth Perry and Jonathan Unger and Anita Chan and Pai Yin Li and very, in several books that have been published in recent years. Um, most of these folks have, have really focused on the current era, on the period of industrial restructuring and the system that's emerged from that and looked back on the work unit era just in briefly in retrospect as kind of a background, a context. Um, my book actually goes back and compares, looks systematically at the first era, the work unit era, and then compares the two eras, as well as the transition between them. Uh, and so in many ways, I'm going back to directly uh, engage Andrew Walder's book and, and his detailed look at the work unit system in China. Actually, six chapters, six empirical chapters in the book are about the work unit era. Only one is about the period of transition and the modern enterprise system that has emerged out of it. Um, I also introduce in this book a conceptual framework to discuss these issues. It involves two factors. Uh, the first is workplace citizenship or industrial citizenship. I look at this as equivalent to citizenship in a national state. Um, in some ways, uh, during this era, during the era of industrial citizenship, enterprises became something of a polity. And the employees of the enterprise became members of this polity and were considered legitimate stakeholders. And that's the meaning of industrial citizenship. That's the meaning I'm giving to industrial citizenship. Uh, the second factor is autonomy. And by autonomy, I mean the right of, of employees, the right of individuals to express opinions and to organize collectively, as well as the right to organize their own affairs, self-management on the shop floor. Um, my premise is that workplace democracy requires both, um, strong workplace citizenship as well as strong autonomy. I look at both of these factors as, as continuous variables, not as dichotomous variables. Uh, they're not an either or question. It's not you either have autonomy or you don't, or you either have citizenship or you don't, but rather how much of a degree of citizenship do you have? Do you have low level of citizenship or a high level of citizenship? The same thing with autonomy. And I look at these two factors can be combined in different ways to form different kinds of, uh, oh, before I get to that, um, a, a high level of citizenship would mean that you're full members of the workplace and that you have an enforceable claim to, the, to your job and that you're considered legitimate stakeholders in the, in the enterprise. A low level of citizenship, on the other hand, would mean that you're basically hired and fired at will. Um, a high level of uh, autonomy would mean that there's really substantial room for expression and for collective action and for self-management in the workplace. Um, <clears throat> and a low level would mean there's little room for expression, collective action, or self-management. Uh, I think that the combination of these two factors can lead to uh, four basic types of uh, factory regimes. Um, if you have a combination of, of workplace, uh, low levels of workplace citizenship, and low levels of autonomy, you get a very common condition, uh, which Michael Bourvoy and many other people have called market despotism. Uh, a typical example might be a high turnover electronics factory. If you have a high level of autonomy, um, but a, a low level of citizenship, you get a, a situation which I call individual autonomy. Uh, you, as an individual, you have a lot of autonomy, but you don't have much uh, power as collectively. An example might be engineers in a software development firm. These are folks that have a high level of skill, they have power in the marketplace, marketplace labor markets, but uh, they don't have much room to act actually organize collectively inside the workplace. You can see this, uh, for instance, in uh, recently at Google when workers have been trying to organize collectively. They have a lot of autonomy, individual autonomy in their workplace. Uh, but they don't have much right to organize autonomously. Um, <clears throat> if you have a high level of uh, workplace citizenship, but a low level of autonomy, another very common 
uh, form of industrial relations you could call paternalism. A typical exa example might be a company town where everything is run by the company. You live there a long time, you have a house there, you, everything is provided by the company, um, but you don't have much rights to organize collectively. Um, another, uh, the fourth uh, type, which is actually very rare, is the combination of high level workplace citizenship and a high level of autonomy. And like I said, I think that those conditions allow the development of workplace democracy. A typical example would be a workers collective where every workers in the collective are members and they have rights to deliberate, decide the, the questions of the collective, the questions of the workplace. Um, another, I think, place where there's a certain degree of workplace autonomy is in some universities uh, where you work, where at least uh, some of the teaching staff have uh, tenure and therefore have job protection and considered members of the university. And uh, this is true at Johns Hopkins where I teach, there's a certain amount of uh, democracy in the institution where as uh, faculty in the sociology department, we meet and we decide on our curriculum, we decide what we need to teach, we decide who we're gonna hire, we decide who we're gonna give tenure to and who we're not. We even have a, <coughs> a academic council where we make recommendations to the university at least, and the president has to come and report on affairs at the university to the faculty. Now, of course, this is a limited type of democracy, but it's much different than most workplaces. And it has to do with the citizenship rights that we have in the university. Um, now, as I said, my uh, presentation, my book is, is exclusively about China. And China, like I said, is particularly interesting to look at these questions because of the radical changes in both in terms of autonomy and in terms of, of citizenship that have taken place uh, in China and in industrial relations in China over the past seven decades. Um, my sources have been, my main sources really have been interviews with workers and cadres in over 50 factories. Um, and these have been carried out extensively for many years now. And many of the, interviewing many of the same people over and over again, they were very generous with their time, for, particularly for the folks that were retired or laid off. Um, another source was uh, factory documents, factory gazetteers and other documents produced in the factory, including factory newspapers. And then as well as public newspapers, uh, official newspapers, all of the uh, many newspapers, the union newspapers and the official um, newspapers in China, as well as those that were published during the Cultural Revolution, which were not so official, published by the various factions during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, today, of course, I'm just gonna be able to give a brief synopsis of the central narrative of the book. I won't have time to do much more than that although I can certainly answer any questions that you have. And feel free to, to send in your questions um, to Trinrong during, as, as we're, the talk is developing, and he will pass them along to me or ask me your questions. Um, and you can send in your questions anytime. Um, so uh, my narrative begins when the, in 1948, when the Chinese Communist Party began to take control of, of China's cities and began to take control of its factories. And what they did, they only had so many cadres. These were all peasant cadres. They had all come from the countryside, virtually all of them. Um, they dispatched a few peasant cadres to every factory. Um, these folks were very good organizers. Uh, they had proved themselves over decades of, many, some of them over decades of this revolutionary war in the countryside and governing the countryside, but they knew very little about urban China. Uh, many of them had never really been to urban China, and they had never been to factories. They knew very little about factories and, and urban China. Uh, what they did, they did not trust the managers and the owners of the existing factories. Uh, they did not trust either. This was both true in private, cap, in private factories as well as in the public factories that were owned by the Guomindang state, um, which there were already a, a, a good part of Chinese industry was owned by the state. But they didn't treat, trust those folks either. Uh, they considered them all to be enemies. And they were they, what they did when they went into factories is they mobilized the workers against the capitalists and the old regime managers. They did this through building a factory party organization on the shop floor. They recruited a handful of workers at first uh, that they trusted to help them organize the factory. And then they organized these mass organizations, which included the entire workforce or virtually the entire workforce through the union and through the staff and workers' congresses. Uh, and then they systematically promoted workers to leadership positions 
uh, replacing the old capitalists and the, uh, and the old managers. Um, they did this through, it took them a decade to take over, fact, almost a decade to take over Chinese factories and really establish themselves as in command of these factories. By 1956, they had nationalized all of industry in China. And they established the, what they called the work unit system. Um, and this system existed from the, 1980, for, from the 1950s through the 1980s. Um, under this system, workers became work unit members. Their status really changed radically. They had been hired uh, for just temporarily in the past, many of them on short-term basis. Uh, their status changed from hired hands to permanent employees. Now, this meant that they had extensive mobility horizontally within, or vertically within the unit. A lot of them were able to move up uh, within the uh, hierarchy within the work unit, but they had very little mobility horizontally among units. It was very, very difficult to change jobs because of this permanent employment system. Uh, they, in order to change, um, move to another job in another workplace, you had to, one, you had to want to do it, two, you had to get the permission of your work unit leadership, and three, you had to get the permission of the new work unit. This was not very uh, easy to do, and it was not very common at all. So most people stayed put their entire lives in one workplace. Uh, the system was also based on relatively egalitarian distribution, much more so than certainly in the past or the present in China or most other countries in the world. Uh, this meant everybody lived in the same apartment complexes. Some apartments were a little bit bigger than others, but most of them, and mostly that was based on family size. Uh, they all uh, rode the same bicycle paths to work. They all used the same healthcare centers. They all sent their children to the same schools. Um, they, <clears throat> they all uh, enjoy ate, ate in the same cafeterias. And in terms of wages, uh, there was not a tremendous amount of difference. Many factories, in fact, in the, the very, a large proportion of factories during this period, veteran workers who had been there from the early 1950s earned more than the party secretary in the factory or than the factory director. Um, it was also the slogan of the Communist Party from the time they took over factories uh, was uh, democratic management. Um, and <clears throat> They, I think that this was a serious slogan. This was not simply window dressing. It meant two things in practice. One, it meant self-management on the shop floor, and it meant that they really encouraged workers to participate in running their own affairs, to take responsibility for their own affairs. They had the meeting every morning before work and every afternoon after work or every evening after work, and they would discuss how, they, how to organize everything on the shop floor. They gave each worker a responsibility for a different aspect of managing uh, work in their particular uh, workshop or in their small group. <clears throat> this did not include, it did not extend up very high. Uh, it did not extend to higher levels in the factory and certainly a lot of the decisions in the factory, the most important decisions were way above their level of actually having much influence on. And of course, in this kind of planned economy, a lot of it took place even outside the factory in the uh, municipality or in the central ministries and the workers had very little to do with those decisions. Uh, the second thing that it meant, the slogan of democratic management, was mass supervision over what they called, what the Communist Party called mass supervision uh, over factory cadres. Uh, mass supervision was really the question I was most interested in, uh, in doing this research. And what it meant to the Communist Party, it was all about the, the Communist Party's concern about controlling its own local cadres maintaining some control over its cadres. It was very concerned about corruption, abuse of power, alienation from the workers, what the party called commandism, about straying from party policies in general. It wanted it to have a highly disciplined command over its, part, its cadres. And of course, it developed a very strong system of control from above. Um, this was a highly centralized, highly hierarchical party, and the party and administrative bureaucracies were very strong and they exercised a strong control over their cadres from the top down. But they never believed that that was enough. They believed that they needed control from below as well and what they called that was mass supervision. It meant, uh, I think this is, it doesn't mean supervision in the typical English, this conjunction, <coughs> jian du, uh, doesn't mean supervision uh, like a supervisor over a worker in any sense, it means I think the best definition is probably holding leaders accountable to their subordinates. Um, so returning to my main uh, concepts or my main concerns in this research, I think that the work unit system featured 
strong workplace citizenship, but weak autonomy. It, there was strong citizenship because workers had permanent job tenure and they were considered legitimate stakeholders. However, it had weak autonomy because the Communist Party tightly controlled all factory organizations. Um, it, and this included the union and the Staff and Workers Congress in particular. Uh, and it, during the 1950s, there were several battles over this question of autonomy. A couple of times, the top union leaders really wanted to gain more autonomy. They said, how are we supposed to represent the workers without having any autonomy from the factory leaders or from the Communist Party at the central levels? And um, they were defeated and they were thrown out of leadership positions or thrown out of <coughs> positions of power. And so they really, this was made clear then, the union did not have any autonomy from the party. The party also maintained a tight rein on the staff and workers' congresses. Um, and they suppressed all potential opposition. Everybody's very uh, familiar with the kind of tight ship that the Communist Party ran, that they did not allow any real opposition to emerge, outside opposition, outside of the party. Um, so uh, this problem was for the Communist Party, this was even a problem for the Communist Party leadership because this, it, since the workers had very little autonomy, uh, it was very difficult then for them to actually exercise mass supervision. The, the big question was how could workers supervise factory leaders from whom they lacked autonomy? And this was a, a, a question that the Communist Party really wanted to resolve somehow. And it did this primarily, it did it through all kinds of means, different kinds of institutions that they tried to set up to have some kind of mass supervision, despite the fact that it was a very, very tight organization that did not allow any opposition. Uh, it did this mainly in the, in the uh, midst of mass movements, or for mass movements that were organized for this purpose. And these are, throughout the Mao era, there were the series of mass movements. I've listed the main ones here. Um, <clears throat> And all of these involved, there were other mass movements as well. These mass movements in particular were ones that really involved trying to mobilize the masses to exercise some kind of supervision over the leaders. Um, before 1956, this was one kind of question. This the two main mass movements during this period were the three antis movement and the five antis movement, 1951 and 1952. In these movements, they could imagine, during the five antis movement, they were really mobilizing the workers. The party was mobilizing the workers against the old capitalists and the old regime managers. Um, and in the three antis movement, this was a movement they were mobilizing workers against their own cadres, but they figured that the main problem was that these cadres were being corrupted by the old capitalists and the old regime uh, managers. And so in both of these, really this problem of autonomy didn't become prominent because uh, they were mobilizing really against uh, what they considered the old system. This became very different after 1956 when the Communist Party really was in control of all institutions. Uh, there were no old leaders really seriously to mobilize against and they were not the main targets of these uh, mass movements after that. They recognized that these were now movements against the Communist Party leaders it, themselves. Um, so it became a more lack of autonomy under this condi these conditions became more a pressing problem. Um, these conditions were that the Communist Party cadres completely controlled all factories. So the subsequent campaigns I look at as experiments to try to introduce some kind of autonomy into mass supervision and it was done in different ways in different campaigns. I'm going to look at three here. I really look at three in some detail in the book. I'm going to look at them briefly here. Uh, the party rectification campaign in 1957, the Four Cleans movement in the early 1960s, and then the Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s. Um, during the party rectification campaign in 1957, this was immediately after the Communist Party declared, we now, this is a socialist country, we're in charge. Um, <clears throat> they recognized that this was different conditions and Mao then immediately organized the campaign this party rectification campaign is also known as the 100 Flowers Movement. The party rectification campaign was a more directed campaign against the uh, local Communist Party leaders. Uh, Mao encouraged freewheeling criticism of communist cadres from below. This had never really been permitted in the past. Um, this was mainly the main center of the campaign, of course, as everyone knows, was in intellectuals in schools and in offices. But it also took place in factories. In a more limited way, it took place in factories. Uh, in factories, it was led largely by the union leaders. They pressed for more union autonomy. This was one of those moments when they really struggled for union autonomy and then were defeated. Uh, and for more autonomy, this was a, now a, a big uh, period of when this, the Staff and Workers Congress were very active. 
and they were encouraging workers to participate in criticizing the, the party leaders in the factory. And at the same time, outside of this uh, formal um, uh, activities that the union leaders were organizing, the workers were organizing protests and strikes. This was a wave of strikes that unprecedented since 1949. Um, but this experiment was quickly aborted. It only lasted about six weeks in full form uh, due to opposition within the party. And as folks who know this history, it culminated or led directly to the anti rightist campaign in the second part of the 1957, in uh, second part of 1957, and on into 1958. Uh, and this was really, it was devastating to this whole question of mass supervision because it really made people reluctant. These, everybody who spoke out was then punished. And so it made people reluctant to raise criticisms uh, for years after that. Uh, the next major campaign, uh, mass supervision campaign, was known as the Four Cleans Movement. This was also known as the Socialist Education Movement. began in 1962, really took off in 1963. Uh, it was initially organized in villages, and actually most of the scholarly literature about it, and most of the public documents about it, were about the campaign in villages, but it also took place in factories. In fact, um, going through, we went through hundreds of gazetteers, of factory gazetteers and virtually all of them that were built before 1963, they all had seen this movement. So except for the ones that were very new, these are big factories that have published these gazetteers we got hold of. Virtually all of them had this campaign. In villages, it only reached about a third of villages, but it got to virtually all of these important factories in China. Um, the party, now Mao went back to the conventional system of uh, ma organizing mass supervision after this big debacle of 1957 with the party rectification campaign and then the anti rightist movement, he went back to sending in party work teams. This is the party, um, the party organizations at the municipality or at the ministry sent in work teams, party work teams into each factory. These, my, these were very big work teams and they sometimes stayed there for months. Um, these, they might involve for a big factory hundreds of party cadres sent in to organize workers. The factory party leaders were then set aside, the local leaders were set aside, and the um, work teams organized uh, activist workers who were then invited to join the work for cleans committees, and all of the workers were mobilized to criticize the factory leaders. These work team committees, these work, these fact for cleans committees mobilized the workers to criticize the factory leaders. It was a very organized campaign. It also was a campaign that they organized that culminated in each factory typically with a new election for new leadership including a new, often a new factory director, and new workshop directors. Um, the problem with this campaign was that workers, the, their entire participation was under the leadership of the work team. So while it did allow this criticism of the factory leaders, it really reinforced top-down authority, the top-down authority of party leaders. Everybody acted under this authority. Um, and this was really, they didn't really solve the problem of autonomy that way. Now it was tightly controlled. It was a fearsome campaign. The fact that it was controlled from above and that it was had very little autonomy did not mean that it was a mild campaign. It was a fearsome campaign. This was uh, these are two other uh, comments of a couple of people I interviewed. One was a small group leader in an electronics plant. He said everyone had to speak up. It was not spontaneous. It was carried out the way movements were supposed to be. He's now comparing it to the Cultural Revolution, for my benefit. Following the regular conventions, it was very serious. Everyone was very tense, cadres and workers too. It was very fierce, very terrifying. It cleaned up the cadres' problems. I think the Four Cleans movement was the healthiest movement. Another point of view from an ordinary cadre in a steel mill, the leaders went through a very difficult time. They had to account for their problems over and over again. All the mid-level cadres had to, quote, shower and steep for three days or a week. They had to confess and write self-criticism essays. It was very undemocratic, very cruel. Everyone was fearful. Everyone was worried. What have I done wrong? Now, clearly, these two folks had both in leadership positions on the shop floor in some ways. They both they had very different opinions of this movement, but just but describe uh, the movement in very similar ways. Um, now, my assessment and the assessment of other people who have studied the Four Cleans campaign is that as well as other campaigns before the Cultural Revolution was that they were fairly effective in curbing cadre corruption. Um, they were less effective in curbing cadres, what the Communist Party called bureaucratic guanliaojui tendencies. 
Uh, these were isolation from the masses or commandism or controlling, restricting, and repressing. This is particularly not having really any accountability to those below them uh, was the meaning of bureaucratic. Um, and this was what was actually Mao's main concern was these bureaucratic tendencies. He was concerned about corruption, but he was not, that was not his main concern. His main concern was these bureaucratic tendencies among cadres. Um, in 19, the end of 1960, or the beginning of 1965, at the height of this movement, uh, he told uh, leaders of the party, when you develop a mass movement, in the midst of the struggle, the masses are going to do what they want to do and they'll create their own leaders. In short, you have to rely on the masses. You can't rely on the work teams. The work teams don't understand the situation or in ignorance, they become bureaucrats and obstruct the movement. Clearly, he's not satisfied with this work team method that he himself put in place. Um, by this time, by the time of the Four Queens movement, it was clear that he had an increasingly jaundiced view of his own party officials. Uh, at that same moment, during at the height of the work team, this is what he wrote to a leader of one of the local work teams. The class of bureaucrats is sharply opposed to the working class and the poor and lower middle peasants. These leaders who take the capitalist road have become or are becoming capitalists who suck the blood of the, suck the workers' blood. How can they sufficiently understand the necessity of socialist revolution? They are the targets of the revolution. Um, so by 1966, the following year, right in the midst of the Four Queens movement, he experimented with a much more radical method of mass supervision, and that became the Cultural Revolution. Uh, at this time, the Four Queens movement still remained, I mean, the Four Queens work team still remained in the factories when Mao started the Cultural Revolution. And then he sent work teams, new work teams into schools and other institutions. But Mao immediately then attacked these work teams everywhere. <laughs> and he called on students and workers to form what he called re re rebel groups, Cao Fan Pai, um, or fighting rebel fighting groups. Now these were autonomous from the local party organization. They were unprecedented in the history of the Chinese Communist Party and they attacked the local party leaders. That was their whole purpose. Uh, this photograph here is of a protest. People are carrying Mao's photo along with his statement uh, bombard the headquarters. By the headquarters, he means the leaders of his own party. Uh, short, except for him. Uh, the workers divided in every factory, the workers divided into rebel and conservative camps. The rebels attacked the party, the factory party authorities and the conservatives defended them. So this immediately led to this huge division in every factory during the final months of 1966. Um, in my assessment, the rebels really became effective agents of mass supervision. And this was because they <coughs> nominated the, they were self-organized. The rebel groups were self-organized. They were not organized from above. The leaders nominated themselves and they recruited their own followers. And they formed small fighting groups in each workshop. And then they formed bigger coalitions as they united with workers in other, work, in other workshops. And then in other factories, um, became larger uh, rebel groups. Uh, <coughs> all of these groups were led by workers. Some of these workers were rank and file party members, um, but typically if they were party members, they were disaffected party members. So they were not part of the party establishment and they were, the whole purpose of them forming these rebel groups was to attack the party establishment. They weren't inspired, this is my understanding from doing this research, they weren't inspired by a particular political program. Mao had a political program, they, weren't, they didn't have much to do with this political program. What they didn't like was the party's tight control and they celebrated what they called rebel spirit. Um, and that became really their main reason for being, was to attack the party's tight control. Uh, they were particularly inspired by Mao's slogan, a big democracy. He had uh, initially talked about this slogan in the, 19, in the 1957 party <coughs> rectification campaign, but he said, now is not the time for big democracy, we'll have small democracy. Um, but if things don't uh, go well, and the party continues to be bureaucratic, we'll need to have big democracy. And what he meant by that was, kind of uh, chaotic and, and uh, unruly and unbridled uh, kind of mass protests, uh, re <coughs> rebellions and revolutions and riots. Um, and this was what the rebel groups were all about. He reintroduced the slogan then during the Cultural Revolution. He said, now is the time for big democracy. A shift leader in electronics plant told me, before you didn't dare speak because of the cadres, but now you could speak the truth. You didn't have to be concerned about what the leaders thought. They were all capitalist rotors. Their power was gone. Um, a railroad worker told me, when we called meetings, the leaders didn't dare talk. They were targets. 
but the conservatives insisted the party committee had not made any mistakes. It was a debate among the masses. We debated all the time, when we were working, when we ate, after work. Now this was an autonomous movement. It was autonomous from the party organization. So in many ways it was autonomous. It was not spontaneous by any means. Uh, the rebels were responding to Mao's call and they challenged the party authorities, but they were loyal to Mao and they could not but be more loyal to Mao. Their entire existence relied on Mao. If it was not for Mao calling them into being, they could not have acted under the conditions that existed in the 1960s in China. And so they had adhered to Mao's directives. That meant they focused on criticizing the cadres. That's what Mao called on them to do. He did not want them to raise economic demands. Uh, so he opposed what he called economism and they followed suit. They immediately stopped raising economic demands, called on folks to stop raising economic demands and condemned economism, what they called, Mao called economism. Uh, this was a movement that other scholars have called a top and bottom versus the middle movement. And I think that's a good characterization. It was Mao at the top, with these rebel groups at the bottom against the party bureaucracy in the middle. In January of 1967, Mao made really an extraordinary call when he called on the rebels to seize power, seize power in all factories, seize power in all localities. Uh, and from that moment on, actually before that moment, factory party organizations were just paralyzed. They no longer functioned. And they didn't function for a couple of years after that. And factories then fell into the hands of contending factions. It wasn't clear who was supposed to seize power. Um, <clears throat> and this led to more complicated and increasingly violent factional conflict between all of these factions and factories. Um, I did case studies of what happened in three industrial cities in Zhengzhou and Luoyang in, in Henan province and in Wuhan in, uh, Hebei, pro in Hubei province. Um, but uh, I'm not gonna have a chance to go into the details uh, in this talk. Um, it takes up the two chapters in the book. I'm only going to go over with some of the common characteristics in this talk. Um, the basic bottom line here is that Mao never intended the rebels for the rebels to take power. He never looked at them as new governing uh, organizations. They were not going to take the place of the Communist Party. He looked at them as temporary agents of mass supervision. Um, and what he called for, instead of the rebels simply coming to power, what he called for was the formation of new revolutionary committees. Um, these would be made up of three types of, of uh, committee members. Uh, one would be the military officers who he sent into every factory, uh, or the military sent into every factory, to the party sent into every, or the very top party leadership sent into every factory um, to negotiate between the old leaders and these new rebel organizations. And then some of the old leaders who the rebels would approve of with some of veteran cadres, as well as representatives of the rebel groups, uh, mass representatives. Um, what this led to, this was, there was a couple of years of increasingly bloody conflict over who was actually going to get to be on these revolutionary committees, and it finally led to a period of, led to revolutionary committees being established in factories, and for many, for some months in many, in many factories, they actually, um, the rebels actually had some influence but ultimately, it led to a period of military rule between 1969 and 1972, uh, where the military suppressed these new authorities, suppressed the rebels, and marginalized the old cadres at the same time. They very violently suppressed the rebels, and they kept the old cadres at bay, and actually these uh, military officers took control of the factories for a period of time until the military was withdrawn in 1972. Both Mao and Zhou Enlai wanted to get rid of the military early, uh, they were not able to do that until uh, 1972, when the military officers were removed from the factories, and that led to a particularly interesting period of factional contention in the factories between 1973 and 1976. During this par period, power was divided in all these factories. The veteran cadres were back in charge, and the parties, the party committees had been reestablished, and they were in charge of the factories. They were the top administrators of the factories, typically, in a few factories, rebels were in charge at least nominally, they were the top <laughs> leaders. But in most factories, it was old cadres. Uh, but former rebel leaders also gained positions of authority inside the factories, typically in unions, maybe in the militia, maybe in propaganda organizations, uh, maybe in some leadership positions. Um, and they were, these were really, they were expected to supervise the veteran cadres in some ways. You could see that that was the, their function. Mao called them and he rehabilitated. Some of them came directly out of jail where they had been put directly into leadership positions in the factories. 
Um, this led to a period of contention between what I call radical and conservative factions in, the, in, the, in each factory. And this was through the entire party organization from Joe Nanahai at the top down to the shop floor. These, the party was divided into these factions. Um, there were, they each had, now they had distinct political programs and they had distinct industrial policies and they would fight over these industrial policies. In Zhong Nanhai, this was, in, there were leaders of the, the two factions were Joe, Joe Enlai and Deng Xiaoping at the top and then the Gang of Four uh, who were um, campaigning against each other. And these, but these factions extended down to the factory floors. And in the factories, they tended to call these folks when they spoke about this. At the time, they called, uh, they called, they talked about the old cadres and the new cadres in the literature of the time, in the newspapers, etc. Uh, they still do that. They still talk about the old cadres and the new cadres when they describe this period. Um, this was also a period of alternating political wins, where Mao was modulating these wins. He would first support the radicals, some kind of radical campaign, and then he would support the conservatives in a kind of backlash against this radical campaign. So the first, the main radical campaign was to criticize Lin Biao and Confucius movement in 1973 and 1974, really a height during the spring of 1974. Then uh, <clears throat> to kind of uh, change directions and, and suppress this campaign, um, Mao called on Deng Xiaoping to organize a rectification movement in 1975. Uh, then he figured Mao, the, Deng Xiaoping had gone too far and he called on the radicals again to organize a campaign against Deng uh, which eventually led to his ouster, the beat back the right deviationist win campaign in 1975 and 1976. Um, both the radicals and the conservatives organized competing mass rallies. They both organized thousands of workers. These were typically based in factories, and they were they organized thousands of workers to go to mass rallies in, in cities competing against each other. Uh, this took place inside factories, but it particularly took place in the city, in the streets of industrial cities. And of course, the most famous of these was the rally at Tiananmen Square to mourn Zhou Enlai um, that culminated on April 5th, 1976. Uh, this was uh, the Tiananmen Square incident in 1976, organized by the conservatives. Um, all of this whole period, this alternating political wins and this contention between radical and conservative factions ended with Mao's death in September 1976. At that point, uh, I look at the, in that, at that point, the rebels were, were purged um, and completely systematically purged from the party after that. Um, I look at the Cultural Revolution as a failed experiment in autonomous mass supervision. Uh, it really could, was composed of two, two phases or two stages. The first was the rebel movement, 1966 to 1969. These were when the rebel organizations actually were allowed to exist. I figure these rebel organizations were effective agents of mass supervision. Uh, they were able to challenge the factory party leaders. Uh, they effectively challenged the factory party leaders and they permanently undermined their authority. Uh, it was not just, that did not end in 1976. The authority of factory leaders were never the same again after that, um, at least for that period of time into the 1980s. And they were able to do this because they were autonomous from the party organization, but their autonomy was limited by their dependence on Mao. Uh, and by the fact that they were only allowed a momentary existence. <clears throat> so uh, the second period was a period, this period of institutionalized factional contention between 1973 and 1976. This was unprecedented in the party system. They had never had anything like this before, but it was within the party system. And that sharply limited the autonomy of all factions because it was operating within the confines of the party system. Uh, and of course, this experiment ended with the purge of the radical faction in 19, after 1976, starting in 1976. And that was the brought an end to the Mao era, of course, Mao's death and the end of this factional contention. I think maybe we can pause briefly to take a couple of questions here, if anyone's submitted any questions yet. Uh, Twin Rong, do I have any questions? I can't hear you, you're still muted. Oh, let me have a look. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I mean, this is a very, a very, very rich uh, uh, and novel investigations on this period of uh, history. Um, maybe I can, I can, I can post a question, a quick question. Hey. <laughs> okay, if you don't mind. Um, I, very impressive, and I, I think my question is all about autonomy and agency mm. and. and um, as you mentioned in the very beginning, that this um, this book is in a 
critical dialogue with uh, Andy Waters' uh, neo-traditionalism uh, thesis. Um, so, uh, so, and you you second to the argument that there's a strong dependency, in other words, a, a, a deficit of autonomy despite strong workplace citizenship, and you measure autonomy in terms of uh, collective bargaining power and self-management. I'm wondering if we can uh, expect some alternative form, like informal uh, collective autonomy, which uh, arguably can be can be based on some shared uh, experience, like in, in school or in military services, or this kind of guanxi. Uh, and they can use those kind of, you know, relational resources to a, a kind of, you know, um, collective uh, engagement. And uh, so this is um, uh, a question about autonomy. And, and, and you, um, on the, on the consequences of this weak uh, autonomy or this kind of unorganized interest, uh, Zhou Guan mentioned that, uh, is that there's a very weak uh, mass uh, supervision and you exam three, three cases and very nice and very, very compelling account. And so, um, and you suggest that this is they failed and, and they lead to a lot of unintended consequences because Mao treats uh, those rebels as uh, temporal uh, agents instead of institutionalized uh, agents. Right? Uh, so um, but I'm just wondering if you could tell a little bit from the bottom up perspective, namely how do workers respond to this uh, uh, continued failure of uh, increasing efforts to increase their autonomy. I, I'm, I'm, I see some other questions, but maybe you can go first, Joe. Okay, so yeah. quickly. Um, I think that that was ex precisely the problem. There was, I think there was actually autonomy. These rebel groups represented some kind of autonomy and that's why they actually were effective in curbing corruption among the, the earlier efforts had even been effective, but effective in terms of curbing corruption, uh, curbing some of the bureaucratic tendencies of cadres. I think they were effective. They certainly put cadres on the defensive. They were able to raise lots of criticisms and they changed cadres behavior for some time to come. This was a period of where there was actually some autonomy, but it was very brief and it was never institutionalized. And that was the problem. There was just never any room in this system uh, that Mao presided over for institutionalized autonomy. He was not prepared to allow that. And so he's not prepared also to allow the rebel groups to exist as a kind of institutionalized form or some kind of uh, develop some kind of institutionalized form to carry on that type of autonomous kind of conflict against the mm. leadership. Um, what did the workers feel about it? I think the vote, I mean, they were split. Uh, every factory split between those who supported the Communist Party leadership and those who rebelled against it. The rebels, of course, celebrated it. This was a high point of their lives. Um, and uh, they thought, I think they're, a lot of them are, are grieved that they were suppressed afterwards. Um, and they, some of them look like, feel that they were betrayed, betrayed by the party or betrayed by Mao. Um, but they celebrate this period and they continue to look back on it. And in fact, a lot of the workers' movements in the, at the, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, these were led by veteran workers or sometimes retired workers uh, who were part of this movement, the Cultural Revolution. And they were very much interested now in, in reorganizing workers. Mm -hmm. I think that's true in the 80s as well. Um, but they, the, this rebel movement who had been severely repressed, they came to life again in the 90s in some ways. And they were a big part of the workers' movement at that time. Mm -hmm. um, let me, do you, let me hear a couple of the other questions. And then yeah, sure. The sure. Um, I, I do have some um, questions uh, from Paul. One from uh, Bo, uh, 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 our uh, a colleague from China Study Program at the University of Copenhagen. I think uh, it's um, a bit relevant to my second question. So the question says, could you elaborate on the opinions you heard from workers about the campaigns of the 1960s to increase mass supervision? Uh, namely, what did these campaigns mean for the workers at the time? And what do they mean for them in restropastic, uh, restropative? That is somewhat similar. Um, yeah. 
like I said, there were a series of campaigns. The biggest ones were the four cleans. And this was almost between the four cleans, which began really in earnest in 63 and factories made more strongly in 64. Uh, and then the Cultural Revolution lasted through the re remainder of the 60s, right? So this was throughout the 60s now, there's these campaigns inside factories, which really caused a tremendous amount of turmoil inside factories. And I tried to, just with these two quotes, of course, I had to pick two out of many to kind of express workers' point of view about the Four Cleans movement. I think that a lot of people thought that this was a good way to criticize the cadres, the leaders of the factory, in some ways they were abusing their power, in some ways, they were corrupt. It needed, they needed this kind of movement. And so they supported this movement. They participated in it. This particular person who I uh, quoted here, he actually became a conservative in the Cultural Revolution. But he thought, and he defended the, the factory cadres then in the Cultural Revolution. He thought that was a crazy movement. But during the Four Cleans movement, he thought this was the right kind of movement, that we needed to clean up the cadres problems. And this was the way to do it through the party kind of organization, mobilizing some kind of criticism from below. And I think a lot of people had that type of sense about the four queens. But of course, the rebels in the Cultural Revolution, and this was a huge part, they were probably in most factories, they were not a majority, but they were a huge part of the factory workforce in every factory. Um, they, uh, of course, thought the four queens movement, some of them had actually been leaders in the four queens movement. They've been selected to be on these four cleans committees. But then they were thrown off because they, they had raised too many criticisms, independent criticisms, ones they weren't supposed to raise. And uh, so they were thrown off of these committees, they were criticized themselves and they became rebels in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and they thought the four cleans movement was just too constrained. Um, and it didn't really get at the cadre's real problems. Uh, and so then they, they thought the Cultural Revolution was much better at that. Uh, there were very different opinions of these, you know, both of these movements. Uh, I think that in general, you would see there was a division, a kind of partisan division among how people look back on it. Uh, the rebels generally supported the Cultural Revolution and the conservatives continued to think it was a big problem. Although you see rebels that then think, well, the Cultural Revolution had all these series of problems and they recognized and acknowledged the problems that it had. Uh, and you also see conservatives that say, well, actually, maybe we needed to do something like that. <laughs> So I think it's a, a wide yeah. variety of things now looking back. I think Here's I should answers. Um, to the show. Yeah. And uh, the rest so of the show, and then we could have more questions at the end. Yeah. Do you mind okay. we pick up two more questions? Or? Okay, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, one question from uh, a PhD fellow from, uh, from the Department of Political Science here at the university. Um, were there variations at the local level of the organizations of the workers' union? Were there places where they were allowed relatively more autonomy? So I think this, this um, speaks to these kind of local variations. Uh, what is, what, how do you observe uh, uh, these kind of local variations and explain mm -hmm. that? Um, now we're, we're talking about the official union here, uh, the All China Federation of, of <laughs> workers. Um, I think that there were, uh, there were variations. I think where the union was att attempting to be more autonomous, that was probably only in some factories. In other factories, the union was never particularly autonomous. Even when the top leaders of the union wanted it to be somewhat more autonomous, it was under the party committee. And the union leaders and the, the people that they were organizing never really took initiative to uh, kind of contest with the leadership of the factory. The places that we hear about, and when I'm talking about the 50s, um, were the places that uh, they really, local leaders, following to a certain extent some initiative allowed by the upper leadership, uh, really took it upon themselves to challenge the, the local leaders of the factory, the local party leaders. Um, and so there was, a, I think there was a great deal of difference. And also workers took it upon themselves, where they had these protests and strikes. I think the union was then involved in mediating those. That was its job, and so it never initiated a strike, even in the even in the fifties. But it was in charge of mediating these, and in some ways, in some ways, it had to deal with these workers that were organizing them, and they were sympathetic. Some of the union leaders were sympathetic with them. That was in the fifties. I don't think the union acted very autonomously after that. Um, mm -hmm. Individual union leaders may have, I think, during the Cultural Revolution. But in general, during the Cultural Revolution, the union was a pretty conservative organization. It was disbanded. Uh, formally, and the old union leaders, well, the old union leaders were fairly, they were part of the conservative establishment for the most part, 
Then during the Cultural Revolution, the late Cultural Revolution years, when the rebels were brought back in, this was another period, they then were put in union leadership positions. Actually, they had converted, in many places, they converted the rebel organization into a union organization in some places. And they became somewhat autonomous. And they, they, but of course, this was different in different factories, depending on the power of the rebels and what they decided to do. Uh, this was during the uh, 1970s. And then, I think in the 1980s, yes, the union, there was variation in the union. Uh, some of them were more, a lot of them were just very kind of party officials. They just went along with the party committee. They didn't attempt to do anything autonomous. But some of them were really invigorated by the 1980s. In fact, they had brought back some of the officials. They got rid of all the rebels. Uh, they purged them out of the union, but they brought back some of these officials from the 1950s. And uh, they were actually, they said, this is an opening now. We can actually do something with the union, with the Staff and Workers Congress. And so there was a little more independence in some of the factories organized by some of the union officials during that period. Not much, and they didn't, uh, for instance, during 1989, during the <coughs> June 4th, um, the union was, I don't think there was much union participation in that. Workers organized that autonomously independently, and the union in general was not very involved in that. Mm -hmm. Today, there's, there's variation in the union. You can see in some places where, uh, especially there was a, a wave of strikes in the 2000s and 2010s in particular the early period and there still is today and union officials once again are in charge of mediating um, and in some of them they're more sympathetic um, and particularly for instance in Guangdong province there was union it depends on the local leadership uh, some of the local un, the union leaders were more they wanted some autonomy for the union and for the Staffenbergers Congress uh, at that point and it was that was also true during the whole period of, of, of uh, restructuring, industrial restructuring. Some of the unions were, they have fought against some of the provisions of, of industrial restructuring that they were laying off workers. We're going to get to that. <laughs> okay. uh, one last question in this, uh, in this break. Uh, can, can we have that uh, before you move on? Uh, sure. I'm fine with me. Oh, okay, great. Um, we have, we have uh, 25 minutes left, but I'm sure we have enough time. This is a question a bit long from, uh, from uh, our colleague in the Department of Cross-Cultural and Regional Studies. Um, so uh, it's a question from non Espet. How did dynamics of autonomy and citizenship related to a uh, question of production? I'm thinking about this system of command outputs that I expect would have been centrally organized in ways similar to Soviet Russia. To what extent were workers radicalized or not, participating in decisions about what to produce and what they were useful to produce for the Chinese economy? How were process about such decisions undergoing changes in the period you look at? Okay. Well, China was a centrally planned economy then, but it was never as centrally planned as, as the Soviet Union. One, they didn't have the bureaucratic capacity to do that. Uh, they simply never developed that bureaucratic capacity. Second, uh, to really do the planning, um, the technological capacity to do the planning in some ways. And two, Mao was against it in some ways. He wanted a more decentralized system. And so he, he wanted local authorities, and this is local communist party authorities, he wanted them making more decisions. So it was never quite as centralized as the Soviet Union, but it was still a centrally planned economy. That meant that the workers, this was the workers, like I said, the workers had power on the shop floor. They did not really have this power over decisions about what to produce. They had power over decisions about how to produce it to a certain extent. At least in terms of their workshop, they had some power over how to produce it. But they never really had power over what to produce. Um, they just never were involved in power and making decisions at that time. Yep. Well, so uh, let's continue uh, this okay. fascinating stories and uh, um, yeah. Okay, so now we're in the post Mao era, uh, starting with Mao's death in 1976. But really, when Deng comes to power, Deng Xiaoping comes to power in 1978, uh, he restored the monocratic party system. And he did this by completely eliminating systematically over a course of three or four years, uh, four or five years, completely eliminating the radical faction. Um, at all levels, from the very top all the way down to the shop floor. Um, <clears throat> many of them lost their jobs, many of them, tens of thousands went to prison, uh, and uh, they were just out of the picture largely. 
Some of them remained in the factories, but they did, certainly couldn't be organized or have any influence anymore. Now this was a monocratic system. This was top-down authority from below. Deng was tired of all this factional fighting, and so was most of the party. So was a lot of the country. Um, at the same time, Deng enhanced these formal mechanisms of workers' participation, uh, including the union, including the uh, Staff of Workers' Congress. At the same time, he also carried out these cautious market reforms in the 1980s. Uh, these were <clears throat> cautious because the work unit system fundamentally remained in place. The fundamental features of the system were that it was public property. There was no private enterprise at this point, tiny little private enterprise. These factories remained public property. Um, and it was based on permanent job tenure. Uh, all the, all the uh, veteran workers retained their permanent job tenure throughout this period. <clears throat> and uh, workers retained for that reason. And because of the kind of legacy of the Cultural Revolution, the legacy of their role in factories, and because of their continued role in this permanent, that have been members of the work unit, legitimate members who can, were considered they had a stake with these formal mechanisms of participation, they retained substantial influence. Um, and this was recalled by many um, workers as a golden era for the Staff and Workers Congress. I think particularly for those that were participating in it, for particularly for the union officials that were participating in it, for, for many workers. Um, the Staff and Workers Congress before that point had had a very unstable history, which I can talk about, I do in the book. I'm very interested in the Staff and Workers Congress. I can talk about this history during the Mao era. It was up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, <clears throat> But at this point, it was more institutionalized. I, if people have questions about the Staff of Workers Congress more during the Mao era, I can certainly answer them. Um, after 1978, Dung institutionalized the Staff of Workers Congress. Uh, it gave it substantial formal powers, more than it ever had in the past. It was now the top leadership in the factory, at least formally. Uh, the factory party director had to answer to the Staff and Workers Congress. The Staff and Workers Congress were entitled to make the final decisions about all kinds of things. Uh, this was formal powers. Um, and it was very, very active. It met all the time. It had leadership committees that were in charge at every level that were met continuously, that didn't just meet uh, once a year or twice a year. The whole Congress met, but once a year or twice a year. Twice a year at that time, many times even more often than that. But it had these ongoing committees. Um, and there were new experiments with factory elections. There were factory elections through this history, experiments with factory elections throughout the Mao era too, starting in the 50s, when I mentioned them during the Fort Cleans movement, certainly when the revolutionary committees were elected during the Cultural Revolution. Um, but now they were more institutionalized in the 1980s, although they were never completely institutionalized, but they did. In many factories, they organized, they elected the factory directors, uh, they elected workshop directors, et cetera. Of course, all of this was under party tutelage now. It was all controlled by the top down by the party. Uh, but nevertheless, they became, the Staff and Workers Congress became an important vehicle for workers' influence. And they had long meetings and particularly deliberating questions of welfare and particularly housing. That became a big issue. That was always, the workers were always concerned about these welfare issues. It was somewhat suppressed in the Staff and Workers Congress to discuss these issues during the Mao era. Now this was what the main issue the Staff and Workers Congress was supposed to discuss, not the political issues of the Mao era. And so they would spend weeks deliberating this question of who was supposed to get housing. And in some ways with very democratic outcomes, <clears throat> which I go over in the book. Um, but all of this was weakened. The Staff and Workers Congress was weakened by enterprise reforms that began in the second half of the 1980s, really 1984 uh, and on extend more extensively, especially after 88. Um, and a couple of the key things there were that they put the factory director in charge not the fact, not the party, um, not the party secretary and the party committee, which was in charge of the staff and workers Congress and the union in charge of uh, kind of uh, all the labor relations, work relations with the workers. Now the factory director was in charge and in charge of making things efficient. And they also start began hiring new workers who were hired on a contract basis, not on a permanent basis, which didn't affect the old workers, but it affected the situation in the factory. Uh, these old workers actually kept their jobs for the most part until industrial restructuring. The big blow uh, came with industrial restructuring, which began, at least the ideas for it began with uh, Deng Xiaoping's 1992 Southern Tour, in which he toured the uh, <coughs> foreign invested factories in Shenzhen and other cities. Um, and he decided this was the way, this more capitalist way of organizing industry was the way to go. We should change all of China in this direction. Uh, it was put, it, 
took place, it was institutionalized gradually in the 1990s. Uh, first, the legal foundations were established. The first of these was the company law, which was <coughs> um, adopted in 1994, which set up what was called the modern enterprise system. Uh, it privatized most of the small factories that were collective or were, uh, <coughs> were um, state-owned. And the large state-owned factories, it restructured. It began restructuring these. And the whole goal was to, in all of these factories, whether state-owned or private, was, the goal now was to maximize profit. This was made extremely clear. And to minimize labor costs. They established the three new committees replaced the three old committees. The three old committees were the uh, party, the union, and the Staff and Workers Congress. The three new committees that were now in charge of the factory were the board of directors, the board of supervisors, and the shareholders meeting. So you can see how the, the, the management of the factories is changing. These didn't always have power, but they more and more have power over time, and it certainly replaced the three old committees in many ways and what ran factories in the institutions, the people that actually ran the factories in some ways. It meant a shift from the party committee to the factory director in a lot of ways. Um, the second major law was the labor law that was adopted in 1995. Uh, this was a huge change for employment relations. It reduced work unit members to contract employees. It took away everybody's basically permanent job status and made them into contract employees that could be hired and fired. Um, and it opened the way then for massive layoffs that took place starting around that time and particularly then in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, now, of course, then the Staff and Workers Congress meetings became venues for particularly sharp conflict their power overall had been taken away. They were no longer in charge of the factory, but they were uh, told that they had to uh, basically sign off on these employee reallocation plans. And so they had to meet and decide how many people were gonna be laid off, who was gonna be laid off, and all the changes that came, what they called employee reallocation. And these became venues for huge conflicts. And then at the same time, huge street protests, as we're all familiar with, these sit-ins and and they, nobody struck because it was a question of closing down the plant anyway or, or um, diminishing who was going to work there. But they occupied factories, they occupied streets, they occupied railroads, etc. cetera. Um, I did a case study in this period of the Brilliant Glass Company. That's a pseudonym. I won't go into that here. Uh, just some of the general conditions that I think affected all factories, all these state-owned factories that were being restructured during this period. Um, this resistance continues to this day. Uh, workers have won temporary victories and partial victories, uh, but they really could not overall stop the restructuring juggernaut that was just transforming everything from the old system to the new system of, of uh, the modern enterprise system and making workers much more precarious. Um, what happened during restructuring was that tens of millions were laid off. Um, the new system that was established was a tiered employment system. Uh, it consisted typically of a shrinking, this is what I found in all these state-owned enterprises, they had a shrinking core of veteran workers who did not get laid off but were waiting to retire. They were the older workers. Um, and, then, and they were really then, in some ways, the core workers for production. Um, and then a growing periphery of precarious workers, younger workers who were hired and fired and came in. Um, and that's the structure that exists in these factories to this day. And it, it, it created a system of vast inequality between the owners of factories where they were private or the leaders of factories where they remained public uh, and the workers. Um, during the Mao era, as I was saying, and even during the 80s uh, to a certain extent, uh, to a large extent, there was a great deal of equality in terms of how wages and benefits were distributed. Uh, that was no longer true now. You have <clears throat> huge differences between the owners of factories and the leaders of factories who now make, can make hundreds and hundreds of times more than the regular workers. Um, and big differences among the workers themselves. Um, and now the whole question of, of uh, industrial relations here, they've got much more harsher conditions in factories, much longer hours. Uh, many workers who I spoke to work seven days a week um, and much more intense labor. Um, and the industrial relations, the relations between managers and workers are simply much more coercive today. Uh, the small teams that used to run their own affairs in the past, they no longer meet. Um, they, and now today, discipline, and they used to enforce their own discipline in many ways. Um, and today, discipline is simply enforced by fines and by threats of discharge. 
Um, and the, in some of these older factories, the large factories, the Staff and Workers Congress continues to meet, but it can, it's in great decline. Uh, they have irregular meetings, they have short meetings, these are very formalistic meetings, there's not much discussion at all. And in many factories, they simply, they say they have a Staff and Workers Congress, but they never meet. In fact, they're, now all factories are supposed to have Staff and Workers Congress, but many of them never even, don't even have anything that looks like this. Um, I think uh, the sense of what is the situation inside factories was uh, characterized by two statements by two workers I interviewed. This was at a privatized fiberglass reinforced plastics factory. It used to be part of this brilliant glass factory. It was spun off and privatized. Um, a veteran worker there, a worker at that factory, had worked there 27 years for the glass factory. It had been shifted to this uh, fiberglass factory. Um, he told me, today, who dares say anything? The factory is private. If the boss wants to employ you, he'll keep you. If not, he'll get rid of you. Back then, you could raise issues. To be blunt, now they don't let you speak. They only let you work. Before, there was some room to discuss things. Since enterprise restructuring, now you just work. That's it. Uh, his boss, the deputy director of the factory, uh, who was also the union chair, says something about the union. It's actually a very typical situation, and the second largest shareholder. He told me, ordinary workers don't understand anything about the enterprise, especially contract workers. Their brains don't think about much. They just work and get paid. That's it. Ordinary workers can't express themselves very well. They're different from us. We see things from a different perspective. We know the situation better. You can see they're describing the same situation, but from very, very different perspectives. Um, to sum up the main points of the book, uh, I think that the work unit system was really never particularly democratic uh, during the Mao era or during the 1980s. Um, but workers did enjoy strong workplace citizenship. I think there was never workplace democracy, but there was workplace citizenship. Um, work unit members, <coughs> they were members of the work unit and they were considered legitimate stakeholders. And they had substantial influence, especially on the shop floor for that reason. However, there was always, their autonomy was always very weak. The union and the Staff and Workers Congress were always under party tutelage uh, and experiments with autonomy, various kinds of experiments with autonomy, but primarily the Cultural Revolution were quickly aborted. It also included the party rectification campaign in 57, quickly aborted and never institutionalized. And without autonomy, it was impossible to develop real democracy. Um, the process of industrial restructuring just then hit at the, at the foundation of the system. It revoked industrial citizenship. Um, that meant it re in reduced these work unit members to higher hands. Uh, they no longer were considered legitimate stakeholders. They no longer had a claim to their job. Now, this did do what Andrew Welder suggested it would do. He was absolutely right. It diminished dependency on the factory. Workers are no longer dependent on the factory in the same way they were. They can quit their jobs. They can go get another job. Lots of them do. They do all the time. So they were not no longer dependent on the factory, but it's severely, inside the factory, it severely eroded workers' power. So both of those things took place at once as a product of this industrial restructuring. It's hard to tell what's going to happen in the future. Um, there's, as everyone knows, there's been huge numbers of strikes and protests in China among workers. Um, these were at the height um, a few years ago. They've been somewhat suppressed by both the economic slowdown and by suppression, repression, and now certainly by the COVID crisis. Um, but they're still the, up until the COVID crisis, there were a large number of strikes and protests. Um, and I think through these strikes and protests, workers may regain a degree of job security. Uh, and if they do gain a degree of job security, I think they'll be in a position to demand more power in the workplace. But until they do, or unless they do, they'll be in a weak position to really demand more say in factory affairs. So that's my presentation. Sorry it was so long. I hope we have a little bit of time for questions in that. Well, um, well, thank you, Joe, and that's uh, such a very, a very rich and insightful presentation. Um, we uh, this talk really triggered a lot of um, uh, very active uh, <laughs> uh, floor participation. We have uh, a lot of questions, and uh, uh, um, can can we um, pick up three questions? And because we have we have uh, only five minutes, uh, six minutes left. Uh, and then you um, answer it together, or, or yeah, please tell me the questions. We'll hear all the questions. Well, I think. One, 
Well, I, I see you. one question travel back to the uh, Mao area and ask uh, uh, by Bo uh, again, uh, why was there such a strong, strongly felt need for mass deprivation of local powders, even after 19, uh, 1957? And what are the legacies of these campaigns? Are some of these legacies still with us today? Are they related to the ongoing debate about the lack of trust in uh, contemporary China? So, uh, so uh, maybe you can go with this question. I, yes, actually, you, give yeah. me a few questions and then I can try to put them together. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, there's another question from uh, a associate professor from Obo University, and well, it's a bit long, and I think there are some um, comments there. How has the link uh, between urban rural citizenship and industrial uh, citizenship developed over time? Okay, and uh, uh, another question, it's uh, what can we learn from this Chinese experience? As, as, experiments in relation to current debates about the post-industry economy and particularly questions about how to secure egalitarian distributions of wealth and autonomy in post-work or even post-capitalist societies. So uh, I'm thinking here of work done by critical geographers uh, Gibson and Graham, uh, uh, Katie Weiss on the uh, well, that's the problems with work, or power mentions slightly provocative suggestions that the role of labor will undergo uh, permanent changes with the introduction of new technologies and value chains. Do you think there are lessons about organizations and mobilization that can be carried forward? Okay, so um, yeah, so maybe one last one. Uh, do you what do we learn from? about what do we learn about industry citizenship in the current era by studying the period from 1950s to the well that is basically about the legacy um and uh, had, as you start out noting the decline of industry citizenship seems to have occurred in many countries in the period you have discussed today what are the most important uh dynamics driving this development the, so, for the uh, last, the decline, yeah. right? Yeah. The so decline. maybe you can uh, combine them together and, and get some, you know. Uh, are we going to, I now have like three minutes, I think. Yeah. Uh, are, do, can we run over a bit or is that I should try to do this in three minutes? Yeah, so I'll see if we have more. Um, but if no, I, I have a very, uh, I have a question also add, um, yeah. add to that. Um, I think um, most of your chapters deal with the uh, working area and, and you characterized uh, labor relations in, 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 in post-reform era. And uh, the, uh, there are new realities, uh, local on, uh, state enterprises are encouraged to go abroad and uh, in a framework belt and road initiative. And this is global, uh, global engagement. So do you see a continuation of uh, power relations in this uh, factory? politics or a quality change um, due to this uh, global uh, uh, exposure uh, compared to the previous era. So I, I think my question is also related to some legacy things, um, continuity yeah. and discontinuity. Yeah. Um, okay, it's gonna be impossible to answer all these questions in a couple of minutes. Can I run over or are people willing to stay a bit longer or should I just try to answer these real quickly? I. I would suggest you, you wrap up then and, and then uh, go through quickly. And uh, okay. uh, yeah, we do have- Okay, I'll try. Have, uh, and I'll, I'll hit I think, a couple of key ones. I'm not gonna be able to do much. The okay. urban rural question is important, I think. And it's one that I have uh, a few ideas about, so I'll share them. I think that uh, there really was, during the Mao era, there was a big divide uh, and through the 1980s. As long as this work unit system remained in place, as long as industrial citizenship remained in place, there was a big divide between rural China and urban China. And since this uh, industrial citizenship system was displaced, was removed, was dismantled, now there's tons of migrant workers, right? To um, more than 200 million migrant workers. And so, and so everything to do with this citizenship in rural and urban is all connected with this question. 
I think then the idea was that, and the reality was that uh, were, there were people were citizens of their villages, of their cooperatives, of their dadwe, of their production brigade in the countryside, and they were citizens of their factories in the, in the city. The Communist Party had ever put everybody to work and had everybody members of one unit or another. They were all supposed to be democratic in some sense. None of them were tremendously democratic, but they were all participants, both in the countryside and the city, and there simply was not much horizontal movement of any kind. Um, and that then was dismantled in the 90s, and that's what then makes much more open labor markets. At the same time, I think it undermines everybody's uh, power within their own workplace, within their own, even within their own village as well. There's been a tremendous polarization of wealth and power in villages as well. Um, oh boy. Um, so we can, maybe we can extend for uh, three, three to five minutes if you need more time to okay. elaborate your thoughts. Um, yeah. Are there, um, the, the potential in a post-industrial economy? I think in China, there's no post-industrial economy. It's still a very industrial economy. <laughs> And I think the position of workers, for that reason, they're a very important part of the workforce. And uh, they still have this possibilities of organizing within factories, which makes workers very powerful. That's why they were powerful during the era of industrial citizenship, was because of these big factories. In China, there's still these big factories, with lots of workers, and they have the potential to organize there. Uh, in other countries, lots of countries, it's very much they don't have this industrial kind of workplaces that they did in the past. But in China, they still do. Um, and I think that they have the potential to organize there. Other places, I think they're find, people are finding new ways to organize. They're using the internet, including in China. And folks in China in particular, they're just very contentious uh, culture. <laughs> There's a lot of contention. People are regular, ready to contend. They've had this whole legacy of contention. Uh, and I think the, the, there will be more contention in the future, both through big workplaces, which exist in China and as well as through the internet and all kinds of dispersed people are organized different kinds of ways. Um, the, yeah, that has to do with the kind of industry abroad. I have not read much. I mean, of course, there's been this, wherever China does construction work, these big Chinese companies, they go overseas and they do this ma massive in construction work and mining and infrastructure construction, et cetera. And they bring huge teams of Chinese workers to do that. And there's been a lot of literature on that. And I, it's very interesting stuff. I don't have any real uh, thoughts to share on it now. And of course, then it's the contentious relations between these Chinese companies and the local workforces too, are a whole other study, you know, worth studying. They don't, the Chinese workers still have something of that uh, legacy. I think they go overseas and you can see that in some of these studies. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationships with workers, the local workers, I think is much more, it is also contentious. Uh, it doesn't have that legacy. Uh, sometimes it has local union legacies, but uh, oftentimes it just has this kind of, uh, outsider insider type of, of conflict, which is, of course, natural. I think it's, it's something that happens when you've got overseas companies coming. Um, that's probably all the time that we have. I haven't gotten a chance to answer all of these questions, certainly. Legacies today of mass supervision. Um, I think there are legacies, I think they're declining. Um, but I think that part of the contentiousness of the Chinese workforce today and all these strikes and protests. And this idea, there's still an idea of egalitarianism that looks at this tremendous wealth disparity as just unjust. Um, you have a tremendous wealth, and the wealth disparity in the United States and China is, is about the same. Um, in China, it's much more, I think, uh, much more controversial than it is in the United States because of this huge change over just a couple of decades. That's it. Well, um, well, um yeah, thank you, Joe. And the, 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 the struggle for industry democracy will never end in, but we are coming to the end of this program. So um, uh, together with our organizers, I, I really want to thank again for sharing this uh, beautiful thoughts.